What does Vladimir Putin want? It's the most important question of 2022. The Russia-Ukraine war is the most significant geopolitical event since the fall of the Soviet Union. It's the biggest military conflict on European soil since World War II. The initiator of the war, Russia, is led by its president, Vladimir Putin. He and his inner circle essentially rule Russia, and they have the backing of most of the population. Putin's unique among European politicians in that he actually wields serious power over his country. While in many countries, politicians take orders from corporations and NGOs, in Russia, it's the other way around. Putin is the one who gives the orders. Because of Putin's decision-making power, exploring his philosophy is absolutely vital to how we in the West should see this war and Russia as a whole. What are Putin's motivations? What does he want the future of his nation to look like? How does he view Russia's relationship with the West? All of these questions and more demand answers, and I'll be providing them in this video. Let me begin by saying that I understand the Russia-Ukraine war is very controversial. There are understandable points of view on both sides. Some people support Ukraine for a variety of reasons, some better than others. And some people support Russia for a variety of reasons, again, some better than others. However, we should note that here in the West, Russian media has been extremely censored, and the average person has really only heard the Ukrainian and NATO side of the story. Russian media has been banned from many social media platforms and even some countries. This hasn't done wonders for people's knowledge about Russia. There was a poll this year that found that 40% of Americans think that Russia is still today a communist country. Misinformation and misconceptions are absolutely rampant about Putin and Russia, and I want to do my part to clear things up. This video's goal is to cut through the red tape to honestly and rationally analyze Putin's worldview. This is the philosophy of Vladimir Putin. We can only judge a man by his words and his actions. So to begin to understand Putin, we have to look at these two things. Let's turn the clock back to February 24th, 2022. Putin gives the order for Russian troops to begin entering Ukraine and supporting the Russian separatists in the region. The night he gives the order, he gives a long speech declaring exactly why he made the decision. This speech has since been dubbed the Empire of Lies speech, as Putin uses this phrase to refer to American global hegemony. Some of the key points he made include, governments of Western countries have been creating fundamental threats to Russia through international subversion, the people ruling Western governments are not open to negotiation. They do not see Russia as an equal and demand a bend to their liberal beliefs. Western leadership ignores all agreements Russia doesn't have the power to enforce. For example, NATO's pledge not to expand eastward. The rules-based international order is a farce where international liberalism is forced upon the world. And finally, American allies like Germany and Japan are not sovereign, but glorified satellite states. Perhaps the most important thing about this speech is that it reveals Ukraine is almost an afterthought to Putin. His problem isn't necessarily with Ukraine, but its current government and the unipolar, liberal international order it's trying to advance. Now, just to be clear here, when I use the word liberal in this video, I'm referring to liberalism specifically. Liberalism is the political doctrine that believes politics should be centered around so-called human rights and individual freedom. Don't worry, I'll elaborate more as the video goes on. Putin believes that NATO, directed by the United States, is merely using Ukraine's government as what he calls an anti-Russia. The crisis has become, in his own words, life and death for the Russian state. He believes the Ukrainian government was plotting with NATO to weaponize the country against Russia as well as to harm the Russian minority in Ukraine. And given how NATO leaders have turned Ukraine into basically a proxy war against Russia, there appears to be some truth to those claims. This is why he ordered the annexation of Crimea in 2014, and it's why he invaded Ukraine wholesale in 2022. Knowing the last 80 years of geopolitics is critical to understanding Putin's mindset here. The United States emerged from World War II as the sole global superpower. Every other major power in the world, on both sides of the conflict, was devastated. Former superpowers like Germany and Japan, on top of being devastated, also lost huge swaths of territory. This ensured that up until present day, both countries have basically been under American military occupation. Putin has even called out the bombing of Dresden and Hamburg in World War II as having no military necessity. He says it was merely done to destroy Germany and reduce its potential power in the future. After the dust of World War II cleared, only the Soviet Union rivaled the United States. But even they were never really in the same economic or military ballpark. 
After the Soviet Union dissolved in the 1990s, the gap between America's power and any of its potential rivals was arguably the widest between nations in human history. No one could compete with America. And for the last 30 years, American elites have used this dominance to project their radically liberal ideology to the entire world. The people who support this policy are generally called neoconservatives and neoliberals. But their actions have left many people and many countries asking the question, should the United States really be the world police? And is liberal democracy really all it's cracked up to be? Now it's critical that we understand Putin's view of these last 30 years and on the Soviet Union specifically. He has an interesting view of the Soviets. He famously said that its collapse was the greatest geopolitical disaster of the century. But contrary to what some think, Putin didn't say this out of any love for communism. Instead, it's because of what happened in Russia after the collapse. It's hard to understate just how laid low Russia was in the first post-Soviet decade. The Russian state was shattered and the economy entered rapid privatization. Inflation, unemployment, alcoholism, and suicide all skyrocketed. Western financiers descended on the country to buy up its bankrupt economy for pennies on the dollar. For Russians, it was a genuine catastrophe. And all this happened while Russia's liberal president, Boris Yeltsin, stood by and let it all happen. He ended up leaving office with an approval rating in the single digits. This was the democratic Russia that Putin inherited. It was under his leadership that Russia recovered from that horrible position. Now at this point, I think it's fitting to deal with the accusations that Putin is a communist. To know whether this is true, we merely need to look at how he governs Russia. Putin is clearly not a communist from both his words and his actions. He's denounced both communism and Lenin directly. He acknowledges the Soviet Union is gone and can't be recreated. The Russian government has partnered with the Orthodox Church and built statues to Tsarist era figures, things unthinkable in the Soviet regime. One of Putin's political idols is the Tsarist era reformer Pyotr Stolypin. He's famous for almost successfully reforming the Tsarist system. He hanged thousands of liberal and communist revolutionaries. However, he was assassinated in 1911 by a Jewish revolutionary who claimed he did it as revenge for anti-Semitism in Russia. One could argue that Stolypin's death opened the way for the 1918 revolutions that ended the Tsardom in Russia. Putin has always looked up to Stolypin as a model Russian statesman and personally commissioned a statue of him to be built in Moscow in 2012. Putin's government has also built monuments to other Tsar era figures, including Tsar Alexander III and Grand Duke Sergei Alexandrovich. Grand Duke Sergei was yet another victim of leftist revolutionary violence, being killed by a bomber in 1905. Commemorating these figures shows that Putin stands firmly against the forces that created revolution in Russia. At the same time, Russian state media has created documentaries like the 2017 series Trotsky. It portrays the Bolshevik period as a time when non-Russians ruled over Russia. I've seen some commentators call this documentary an explicitly fascist piece of media. But this doesn't mean that Putin has entirely repudiated the Soviet Union. Russia holds a Victory Day parade every year to commemorate the Soviet victory in World War II, and the bodies of Lenin and other Soviet leaders still reside in Moscow. So, it's complicated. Putin believes that, for better or worse, the Soviet Union is part of Russian history. The good and the bad must be taken together. And even if he personally wanted to start wiping Russia clean of its Soviet symbols, the Russian public isn't ready for that anyway. What's clear in all this is that Putin sees the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union as manifestations of a powerful Russia, a Russia that was a sovereign world power. He wants Russia to have that kind of sovereignty in the world again, and he directly tells us why. A powerful and sovereign Russia is able to negotiate with other powers as an equal rather than as a subject. This isn't just out of a desire for raw power, it's driven by the real fear that the liberal world order abuses countries who are unable to defend themselves. As Putin said in one of his speeches, anything that does not suit the powers that be is denounced as archaic, obsolete, and useless. At the same time, everything it regards as useful is presented as the ultimate truth and forced on others regardless of the cost, abusively, and by any means available. One might think of Libya and Iraq, victims of liberal aggression, as an example of what he's referring to. In other words, Russia sees the so-called rules-based international order as a farce in which the powers that be engage in an ends-justify-the-means campaign to enforce liberal ideology on the entire world. When the United States and its allies destroyed Libya, what rules were being followed then? 
when they invaded Iraq and Afghanistan, where were the rules? Any rules were simply ignored when it was convenient for them. Let's not forget the invasion of Iraq was done on completely bogus claims that they had weapons of mass destruction. They didn't. American intelligence groups lied. Surely this was a violation of international rules. Yet nothing ever came of it. This constant hypocrisy is why Putin declared, Therefore, one can say with good reason and confidence that the whole so-called Western Bloc, formed by the United States in its own image and likeness, is in its entirety an empire of lies. But this aggression from Western elites isn't just physical. It also comes in the form of spiritual and mental assault. They promote atheism, LGBT, pornography, and mass immigration everywhere they gain a foothold. Countries that were once majority white Christian, like France and Germany, have slowly been transformed by liberal forces. Within the next few decades, their native populations could become ethnic and religious minorities in their own countries. Putin sees this as an inevitable outcome anywhere liberal internationalist ideology takes root. He does not want it in Russia. To quote him again, they sought to destroy our traditional values and force on us their false values that would erode us, our people from within. The attitudes they have been aggressively imposing on their countries, attitudes that are directly leading to degradation and degeneration because they are contrary to human nature. Since World War II, the political ideology of liberalism has manifested mainly in what's called liberal democracy. This is a democracy where minority rights are given precedent over the rights of the majority and anti-liberal ideas are banned from discussion. It's this philosophy that Putin believes has gotten out of control. But why would he believe this? Let's again use some examples, like the European Union. The EU withholds funding and engages in political sabotage in order for its members to accept liberal causes like the LGBT movement, abortion, mass immigration, etc. Various international NGOs infest liberal democracies and push anti-traditional agendas to the youth. Because the mechanisms of liberal democracy give these NGOs the right to say and do whatever they want, politicians in these countries are powerless to stop them. This is why support for all forms of liberal attitudes have skyrocketed in Europe over the last few decades, especially among young people. One side of the argument is promoted by all of these international forces, while the other isn't even allowed to make its case. Putin actually believes that much of this ideology is deliberately promoted by America to weaken its rivals and so-called allies. In effect, the American elite is using these things to weaken its rivals, to destroy nation-states. This goes for Europe and the identities of France, Spain, Italy, and other countries with centuries-long histories. Some portray Putin as someone who hates the West, but quotes like this show it's actually the opposite. He believes Western countries have great histories that are being thrown in the trash by their own governments. Let's look at a country like Ireland as an example of the trend Putin's talking about. When the country gained its independence in the 1920s, it was almost entirely ethnically Irish. It was over 90% Catholic and maintained its traditional Irish culture. But after 100 years of liberal democracy, the country is now undergoing mass immigration, Catholicism is declining, abortion is legalized nationwide, and LGBT is not only legal, but criticizing it is banned. One could easily argue that the liberal system is destroying Ireland's identity and culture. Putin and the rest of the Russian leadership know this. They've watched it happen in real time, not just to Ireland, but to many liberal democracies. Meanwhile, Russia, over the same time period, has effectively banned pornography and LGBT propaganda. It's cracking down on abortion and promoting Christianity. It also doesn't demonize its majority Russian population, and Putin has even flirted with ethnocentric ideas. When annexing the Russian areas of Ukraine, he said, There is nothing stronger than the determination of millions of people who by their religion, culture, traditions, and language consider themselves part of Russia whose ancestors lived in a single country for centuries. All of this is to say that Russia has gone down a wildly different route than America and its allies over the last 50 years. Some American politicians are now even calling Russia a world center of anti-feminist, anti-gay, and anti-trans hatred. It seems that many Western leaders hate Russia because it's a white, Christian country that doesn't bow down to them. Notably, this is the same hate they hold for white Christians in their own countries. So how did the West get into this dire situation, and why hasn't Russia gone down the same path? We should start with the fact that Russia comes from a similar, but different, philosophical tradition as the West. 
Western countries, traditionally, were rooted in Catholicism and Greco-Roman philosophy. Christianity, especially Catholicism, dominated the Western world for over 1,500 years. But obviously, that's not the case today. The Catholic Church now does not hold sway over any Western government. That's because modern Western countries are the product of a revolt against Christianity born from so-called Enlightenment philosophy. This philosophy undermined Catholic and Protestant governments alike until secular liberalism became uniform across the entire Western world. The international order being based on Western liberalism was solidified after World War I and II. The more traditionalist countries lost both of those conflicts. So while Christianity still exists in Western countries today, and in many of them even makes up a majority of the population, Christians do not hold the levers of power. We are subjects. Russia, on the other hand, had a different political development. They come from an Orthodox Christian tradition, which began moving in a different direction from Catholicism since the Great Schism of 1054. The Catholic and Orthodox traditions have a lot in common, but they also do have differences. As the years went by, Russia didn't have a Reformation or an Enlightenment in the same way that the West did. They were later to both the development of capitalism and the Industrial Revolution, two major changes in human civilization. This meant the traditional Russian system, the Tsardom, was able to last all the way until World War I, when it finally fell to liberal and communist revolutions. Russia's liberals were overthrown by communists before they could even begin to bring liberalism into the country. Thus, Russia effectively skipped liberalism in its political development. Instead, communism ruled over the country for over 70 years. It then finally collapsed from its own contradictions in the 1990s. I'll note that communism, like liberalism, is an enlightenment philosophy, but they both place emphasis on different things. While liberalism focuses on radical ideas of liberty, communism focuses on radical ideas of equality. Both ideologies are secular and are both breaks from the Christian tradition of Europe. However, of the two, liberalism proved much more lasting and effective at indoctrinating entire nations into following it. While communism couldn't even last 100 years, liberalism has continued and has only gotten more radical in its approach to so-called liberty. Note how today, major political parties in liberal countries argue for the liberty of children to get sex changes or the freedom of companies to distribute pornography. American scholars like Robert Bork observed this trend firsthand as early as the 1960s. In his book, Slouching Towards Gomorrah, he wrote, we have learned that the founders of liberalism were wrong. Unconstrained human nature will seek degeneracy often enough to create a disorderly, hedonistic, and dangerous society. Putin understands all of this history, and he seems very happy that liberalism never took root in Russia like it did in the West. He subscribes more to a political philosophy called reactionary modernism. This philosophy involves integrating aspects of modernity into a traditional moral framework. This means making some concessions to the Enlightenment, like having a parliament, minor voter representation, nationalism, male suffrage, etc. Francisco Franco Spain and Fascist Italy are examples of this political philosophy. This is why, despite Putin and his circle ruling Russia with an iron hand, they still have a constitution and a parliament. In their view, the world has changed too much to go back to a feudal or pre-modern system of government. But unlike in the West, it doesn't mean you have to abandon the moral and spiritual values of those eras. Much of this comes from the fact that Putin himself is a Christian, and I believe his faith is genuine and plays a major part in his worldview. The Russian government has had a completely new relationship with religion since the fall of communism in the 1990s. Under communism, Christianity was suppressed and atheists were promoted. But the Russian state that emerged from communism's rubble is practically the opposite. The Russian Orthodox Church has a close relationship with the Russian state that's very different from the way churches work in the modern West. Religions in Russia operate in a tier system where traditional religions get more privileges. Orthodox Christianity sits alone in the top tier and is basically recognized as the official religion of Russia. Other traditional religions like Catholicism and Islam are in the next tier. While they don't get as much benefits as the Orthodox Church, they're tolerated and given serious recognition. Finally, in the bottom tier, you have newer religions like Scientology. They get the least privileges. So while Russia isn't a theocracy exactly, it's far different from a secular government that treats all religions as equal. Putin strongly disagrees with the idea that governments should treat religions like Christianity and Satanism the same. Speaking of Satanism, Putin has called modern liberalism itself Satanic. This complete renunciation of what it means to be human, 
The overthrow of faith and traditional values and the suppression of freedom are coming to resemble a religion in inverse, pure Satanism. Putin's been careful in everything he said to point out it's the people governing Western countries that he's in conflict with, not all Western citizens. He sees traditionally minded Westerners as occupied peoples living under elites that despise them as much as they despise Russia. In an October speech, Putin pointed out he believes there are two Wests. One is a West of traditional, mainly Christian values with which Russians feel kinship. But there is another West, an aggressive, cosmopolitan, neo-colonial, acting as a weapon of the neoliberal elite and trying to impose its pretty strange values on the rest of the world. Thus, Putin believes that Western leaders want to destroy not only Russian culture, but all traditional cultures in the world. Let me repeat, the dictatorship of the Western elites targets all societies, including the citizens of Western countries themselves. This is a challenge to all. The craziest thing about this whole situation is that Putin was open to integrating Russia and the West, but Western social policies have gotten so intolerable that he would rather go to war than have them take root in his country. This affinity for the West is part of what separates Putin's philosophy from Alexander Dugin. Dugin, by contrast, has fully repudiated the West and believes Russia must embrace full-fledged Eurasianism. There's a growing consensus among scholars that Putin doesn't follow any one specific philosopher. He firmly believes that the Western liberal system has failed and alternatives to it emerging are inevitable. Ultimately, Putin does want peace with the West, but a peace where Russia's civilization is respected and not meddled with. This isn't just about protecting Russian minorities in Ukraine. It's about solidifying a multipolar world order. A world order where America no longer dictates terms to every country it deems backwards or failing to meet its definition of free. The Russian state says it must be treated as the thousand-year-old civilization that it is, and not just another pawn to be forcibly injected with liberal values. Current Western leaders refuse to compromise on any of these points, and thus the Ukraine war was inevitable. I made this video because it's important that we understand Putin's philosophy. He represents the views of both the Russian elite and the majority of the Russian public. He is not a man standing alone. He's not a puppet of a shadowy cabal. He's the legitimate ruler of an entire nation. Understanding the philosophy of Putin will help us achieve a more just, moral, and peaceful future. And hopefully, a better West. This has been Pax. Please leave a like and comment letting me know your thoughts. If you enjoyed this video, definitely subscribe. And as always, I will see you all in the next video.